Hello everyone and welcome to the Bioroom Seminars. My name is Ilia Magrinelli and I'm a postdoc in the lab of Ludovic Telli at the University of Lausanne. The story I will talk to you about mostly took place during my period as a postdoc in the Denis Chabaton lab at the University of Geneva. In this project, we try to understand the origin of the heterogeneity of the cell populations that are born during the development of the neocortex. We start by introducing what is the neocortex. It is the larger part of our brain by volume, and it is characterized by a huge amount of connectivity with the other regions of the brain, which is at the base of its vast range of function. Many people refer to the neocortex as also the mammalian neocortex. In fact, this structure is present only within the mammalian species, and during evolution it underwent a dramatic change in size and organization, although in all of the species we are always able to find a similar organization within primary and secondary areas which is maintained whether we look at the mouse or at the human. One of the reasons why during evolution this structure managed to undertake such a dramatic number of changes is its modularity. In fact, whether we look at the most rosal part of the cortex or the most caudal one, we always find a similar organization into six layers. Each of these layers contains a specific group or groups of neurons that share similar functions and connectivity. Classically, these neurons have been described because of their typical pattern of collectivity, their morphology, or retrophysiological properties. And more recently, thanks to advances in techniques such as the single cell sequencing, we have been able to access also the molecular viability that each of these type of neurons has. Being a developmental neurobiologist, understanding all of the pieces that constitute a structure is only half of the job. And it is in fact almost as important to understand how those pieces came to be and how did they get there. For this sake, let me start by briefly introducing a few concepts on the development of the central nervous system. The developing nervous system is organized as a tube, which is subdivided into vesicles. Each of these vesicles will give birth to a specific part of the brain. Let's now concentrate on the most rostral part of the developing nervous system, which is the telencephalon. This part, already during development, is highly organized, and in the most dorsal part of it is where the neocortex will come from. All of the progenitors are usually in close proximity to the surface of the ventricle. And initially, these are self-replicating progenitors that are called neuroepithelium. This neuroepithelium will then generate the first neurogenic progenitor, meaning the progenitors that will start to give birth to neurons. And during the development of the mouse, which usually lasts for 19 days, the neurogenesis of the cortex will start at E11 and will go on until E16 or E17. We already know that proceeding during neurogenesis, there is a shift in the contribution to the neurons that will populate mostly deep layer, which are born in early development, to the neurons that will populate more superficial layers, which are usually born later on. The main goal of our project is to understand the precise contribution of each neurogenic day to the specific layers of the neocortex. In order to perform this task, we took advantage of another specific behavior of the developing nervous system, which is called interkinetic nuclear migration. All of the progenitors that are in proximity of the ventricular surface are in fact continuously occupied in an up and down movement, which sees them approach the ventricular surface and then leave it. More importantly, the position that they occupy in relation to the ventricular surface also corresponds to the cell cycle phase in which these neurons are occupied. When they are the furthest away from the ventricular surface, they are in S phase. During G2, they will approach the ventricular surface and then they will enter M phase when they are in contact with the ventricular surface and once they will leave this area, they will enter G1 or they will differentiate. The lab of Denis Javodon had previously developed a technique called FlashTech, which consists in injecting a um, compound directly inside the ventricle of the developing brain. This compound will then 
Enter and permanently tag the cells that are in, close, in the closest proximity to the ventricular surface, which allows us to identify the neurons that are born in a very small fraction of time that corresponds almost to one hour and a half. In this project, I combine the flash tag technique with a constant perfusion of beer dew starting at the moment of the flash tag injection. By combining a double staining of flash tag and beer dew, I could therefore identify neurons that incorporated the flash tag but did not incorporate beer dew, meaning that they did not enter S phase again after the moment of the flash tag injection. In this way, even after a long time, we were able to identify neurons that were born specifically at the moment of the flash tag injection. By repeating this experiment at each neurogenic day during the development of the mouse neocortex, we were able to precisely identify how each neurogenic day contributes to the formation of specific layers of neocortex. While as expected, we could reproduce the typical inside-out pattern of corticogenesis, meaning that early neurogenic days contributes to deep, to deep layers of the neocortex and later days contribute to superficial layers of the neocortex, we also observed a great disparity in the variability of the laminar position produced during the early corticogenesis and late corticogenesis. To confirm our result beyond the biological variability across different animals, we decided to perform a double injection of flash tag, which is identifiable by their two different colors, within the same animal and at a very small interval of time one to each other. So, we started from E13.5 as the representative time point of the early corticogenesis and we injected flash tag once and then again after six hours. And then we repeated the same thing, but starting from E15.5. While the radial position of E13.5 born neurons and the cohort born six hours after did not occupy a radial position substantially different from one another, we could identify a significant difference in the radial position of the neurons born at E15.5 and six hours after. As cortical neurons that are usually located in different layers of the neocortex are associated with different functions and connectivity, and since our previous result showed that early born neurons of the cortex can populate different layers of the cortex, we decided to investigate whether or not early born neurons would also assume a different set of connectivity and functions. For this purpose, we perform a set of three different retrolabeling experiments on E13.5 injected flash tag brains. In a first set, we injected retrolabeling beads on the contralateral side of the cortex in order to label interhemispheric cortical neurons. Then we injected retrobeads in the thalamus in order to label corticothalamic neurons located usually in layer 6. And on a third set of experiments, we inject in retrobeads on the spinal cord in order to detect corticospinal neurons, usually located in layer 5. In line with our expectation, we could detect E13.5 born neurons that projected both to the thalamus, to the spinal cord, and to the contralateral side of the cortex. Ultimately, we decided to investigate the molecular variability of early born neurons in the cortex by looking at the total transcriptome. For this purpose, we performed patch sex sequencing on E13.5 born neurons, meaning that we used the flash tag injected at E13.5 to identify neurons and, using a pipette similar to those used for electrophysiology, acquired the entire cytosol and nucleus, which was then used to perform a total sequencing of the mRNA of each single neuron. At the moment of capture, the radial position of the neurons was also recorded and was then used to reconstruct an artificial neocortex where all of the layers were made of E13.5 born cells only. Comparing the pattern of expression of genes that are typically expressed in specific layers of the neocortex, we could reproduce a similar pattern of expression also in the pseudocortex made of only E13.5 born neurons. We also confirmed these results for a few of these genes with immunofluorescence protein detection. Summarizing our results until now, we can state that early born cortical neurons can assume a different set of identity and laminar position which is not tightly correlating to the time of their birth, 
while late-born cortical neurons assume a laminar position and an identity that is more tightly correlated to their time of birth. What we still don't know is what is exactly the source of variability of the identity of early-born neurons. To answer this question, we used a dataset published in the paper from Tele in 2019, where cortical cells born at E12, E13, E14, and E15 were collected after 1 hour, 24 hours, and 96 hours after the birth using the flash tag technique. Without entering too much in the detail of this paper, this dataset allowed the authors to describe common axes of temporal progression and differentiation, as well as the different clusters of cells that formed during corticogenesis. In our case, we use this dataset in order to answer the question of what is the main moment during cortical differentiation when early born cortical cells develop the heterogeneity we observed in the previous experiments. At first, we use dimensional reduction in order to investigate the variance of gene expression across the full dataset. As you can see from this plot, where we look at the variance of one-day-old neurons, is the moment when we find the highest variance of gene expression, and it's also the moment at which we find the highest difference between the variance of gene expression be between early-born and late-born. This information also translates to the situation that we find in the adult cortex. By performing the same test on a dataset of adult neurons, we were able, in fact, to identify a higher variance between deep-layer cortical cells, meaning early-born cortical cells, against superficial layer cortical cells, meaning late-born cortical cells. As a follow-up, we perform clustering analysis focusing on only the one-day-old neurons. Here we could identify three main clusters, of which three clusters were mainly composed of early-born cells, while two clusters were mainly composed of late-born cells. Interestingly, while the first three clusters are also equally distributed between E12 and E13-born neurons, in the other two clusters, the proportion between E14 and E15-born neurons indicates that these clusters are mostly representative of the time progression axis. While in the first three clusters, we observe a variability which is beyond the actual date of birth and is in line with, and is in line with our previous observations. Finally, we try to characterize what type of genes corresponding to the most variable genes at the 24 hours time point. As expected, in fact, early born one day old neurons are the population that within this dataset displays the highest number of highly variable genes. If you look at the expression pattern of the top 50 most variable genes of E12 and E13 born neurons, we observe a pattern of expression that increases from E12 and E13 to E14 and E15, indicating that these genes are most likely important for the late time point identity and are partially being expressed also during early corticogenesis, introducing a source of variability and stochasticity in the differentiation program of early born cortical neurons. So in conclusion, this project describes a situation in which early-born corticogenesis generates a set of highly heterogeneous cortical neurons that can populate different layers and assume different functions. While late-born corticogenesis, while during late-born corticogenesis, the time of birth is more tightly linked to the type of neuron that will be produced. Drawing a parallel with the classical model of the cell differentiation introduced by Wadin, Cortical cells during development, during the early phases of corticogenesis, will encounter a landscape which is far from being homogeneous, as in fact the stochastic introduction of gene expression, mostly associated with the late corticogenesis, introduces variability in the process of differentiation of these cells, while as time progression goes on, the differentiation program becomes more straightforward and more linked to the time of birth of the cell. For this conclusion, I want to take a few moments to thank all of the members of the Nisha Badon Lab where I performed this project, as well as the funding agency EMBO that supported me during this project. And I also want to thank my current lab, which is that of Ludovic Telli at UNIL, and Camilla Bellone's lab that collaborated to this project. And I ultimately thank you for your attention.